The way to increase your sensitivity is to simply, every time you feel the Spirit speaking to you, do it. You say, but what if it's not God? That's the wrong question. What if it is? But if you quench the Spirit, you turn off the power, and your sensitivity is forfeited. And wherever you and I, when we respond in obedience, when God speaks, there is always the power from him to do something in the midst of our obedience. I want to talk to you in the next few moments, just briefly, and then we're going to spend some time praying about growing in our sensitivity to the Spirit. Because a person can say they're filled with the Spirit, but that's not, being this, that's not the same as being full of the Spirit. Because we all have the, the problem of we leak. Uh, so God fills us up, and we need to be constantly, continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So uh, it doesn't matter if you were filled with the Spirit last month, last week, you need a fullness of the Spirit and really the mark and the measure of how full you are is how much power you have because you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be a witness. So if you have a fear of man, a fear of people, then you're not as full of the Spirit as you need to be. And if you've never been full with the Spirit, then don't write it off and don't let your background and don't let your questions consume you. Just say, God, I want all that you have and I, I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. As well, we could say that being filled with the Spirit doesn't necessarily make us sensitive to the Spirit. God wants us to have a consciousness of his presence in our life. And when you and I engage the Holy Spirit at that level, where we say, I want to be sensitive to you, not just when I'm in church, not just when I have my prayer time, not just when I'm facing a problem, not when I'm just in, in front of a person, but I want to 24-7 have your presence on my life in such a way and my heart turned toward you in such a way that there's a constant communion with you. Back during COVID, I mean, people ask me at times, uh, uh, how do you see the start of all that's happened to James River? Really, if I'm going to trace it back, I'm going to take it back to 2021. During COVID, uh, I was preaching. might have been 2020. During COVID, I was preaching uh, in the fall at, a, at a, uh, a gathering and in Florida. And they'd asked me to talk about the Holy Spirit. And the Lord really made a life to my heart in a unique way. John chapter 1 and verse 32. I'll read it to you. John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. John the Baptist is talking about Jesus. And he's saying, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. He just didn't come down on him, but he remained on him. I would not have known him except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain. He is, is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. So the thing about Jesus that, that by which he did, though he's the son of God and could have done anything as God, Philippians chapter two is very clear that he set aside the prerogatives and the privileges of deity and did what he did through the power of the Holy Spirit to show you what is possible for any believer who is full of the Spirit. You get an idea of this in the gospel in Luke chapter 5, where it says this, one day he, that Jesus, was teaching Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem were sitting there, and the power of the Lord was present for him to heal. How did he know that? He was sensitive to the Spirit. Jesus, though as God he could have done anything, said in John chapter 5, I only do what I see my Father doing. So while he's on earth, he is functioning in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's sensitive to the Spirit. The Spirit of God remains on him. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 38, Peter preaching says, And you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. 
Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. How was God with him? He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. When you and I are walking in a sensitivity to the Lord as we invite the Spirit of God to come down on us and remain on us, it does something to us. It changes how we live. It changes how we view things. It makes a massive difference. And it really is the start of cultivating a a greater sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. So let me just give you five ways to do that, just quickly. Five ways to cultivate or to grow in your sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Number one, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This has to do with purity in the life of the believer. There are some things that grieve the Holy Spirit, and when you grieve the Holy Spirit, you create a block between you and what the Spirit of God wants to do in your life. For example, Paul writes this, put off your old self, verse 22. So if you're operating in your flesh, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. Speak truthfully. If you're telling white lies, if you're an exaggerator, if you're telling things that are almost true but not quite true, you're grieving the Holy Spirit. If your anger, if you have, if you have anger, anger uh, that is not sin is that which is at sin. But anger on its own grieves the Spirit of God, stealing, taking what is not yours unwholesome talk. So you tell them the coarse joke. Excuse me, but I just have to tell you this. It's so funny. No, you're grieving the Holy Spirit and that diminishes the work of the Spirit in you and on you. Bitterness and slander. Talking about people. Saying unkind things about people. Having a bitterness in your heart regarding what somebody, what you didn't get and somebody else did is usually how that works. Or what somebody did to you. And then he talks about operating in a forgiveness, which is a key to moving beyond all that other stuff. Now, grieving the Holy Spirit is different than repentance. Repentance is something you do when you know you've grieved the Holy Spirit. So when you know that there are things in your life that dishonor the Lord, that are displeasing to the Lord, then there is a need for repentance. Not just, oh, God understands. Not just, hey, you know what? Uh, nobody's perfect. Don't excuse your sin. Repent from your sin. Turn from it. Not grieving the Holy Spirit. Different than repentance. To not grieve him means you don't want to let anything in your life that's going to displease him, that's going to dishonor him, that's going to bring you to a place where repentance is even necessary. So you're walking with this clear conscience because you're saying, I so value the friendship of the Holy Spirit and the presence of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in my life and through my life, and I so want it. I want it so desperately. I don't want one thing in my life that is going to keep me from having an increasingly intimate fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So you guard not only your words, you guard your heart, you guard your thoughts, because you don't want to grieve. You're constantly, it's, you're just aware of his presence, and any time you feel that beginning to dissipate, you, you immediately are like, what, what's happened? What did I do? So that you can have that proximity to him and that ability to hear him and you can grow in that. Number two, don't quench the Holy Spirit. So grieving has to do with purity. Quenching has to do with power. First Thessalonians 5.19, do not put out the Spirit's fire. The ESV says, do not quench the Spirit. 
When the Holy Spirit is leading you to do something, if you say no, he will stop speaking. He's not, in my experience, going to argue with you. He's simply going to say it, and you either buy it or you don't. If you want to debate it, you diminish his voice and your ability to hear his voice in your life. And no amount of sensitivity can overcome disobedience to the voice of the Spirit. This, I would suggest, is something that foils a lot of Christians when it comes to really seeing God do powerful things in their life because they constantly want to argue with God until they can understand what he wants to do in their life. I, I, don't, I don't see how that could be. Is that really you? Is that, and rather than, than cultivating a sensitivity that says, I know his voice, and I'm going to step into it. I don't have to understand it to follow it. It doesn't have to make sense to me to do it. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 29, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So he's on the road to Gaza. They're going through a wilderness area. Philip's there. He sees a chariot apparently in a distance, or so he has to get near it. And the Spirit says, go to that chariot and stay near it. He has every reason in the natural not to do it. I mean, he could say, this can't be God. It doesn't make sense. If he does that, he's done hearing from God in that moment. If he says, well, I'm not an Ethiopian. Obviously, that guy's an Ethiopian. What if I don't speak his language? How could I have anything to say to him if he can't understand me? It can't be God. Or he's a royal official. I'm just a commoner. He, why would he ever listen to me? He wouldn't want to hear what I have to say. Or he could say, he's an Ethiopian. He's probably a pagan. I'm a Jew. I, I don't know how we would have anything in common at all. And I don't know why going up there would be, this can't be God because it makes no sense to me. But he goes. And that not only results in the Ethiopian getting saved, but it opens Philip's life up to a greater work of the Spirit of God in him and a greater experience of God's power. It's very interesting. Read it. When they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, which is Ashdod in the Old Testament. So he goes to a whole different, whole different place. I mean, honestly, for some of you husbands shopping with your wife at the mall, the quickest way out of there is to go share Christ. You might end up at the Chiefs game. I mean, who knows? <laughs> It should be a really good thing this weekend, wouldn't it? You say, but what if it's not God? That's the wrong question. What if it is? And wherever you and I, when we respond in obedience, when God speaks, there is always the power from him to do something in the midst of our obedience. But if you quench the Spirit, you turn off the power, and your sensitivity is forfeited. The way to increase your sensitivity is to simply, every time you feel the Spirit speaking to you, do it. You say, but what if I'm wrong? Again, what if you're right? And too many times, Christians talk themselves out of the will of God and out of an opportunity to experience God's power in their life and through them in the life of another person because they debate it down to where faith is gone, sensitivity is lost, and God's power is dissipated. Number three, worship. If you want to be sensitive to the Lord, just be a worshiper. Our worship brings us into God's presence and it 
brings his presence into our lives. I love corporate worship, and our worship, honestly, is, is some of the best ever. I mean, it is just so wonderful. And I'm so grateful for our team. They're writing songs for an album. It's going to be amazing. So um, I think they have 40 songs right now that they're working on. And so it's, it's fantastic. You say, when? Uh, we'll keep you posted. You can pray about it. Our personal life has to be one of continuous worship. If all the worship you do is in the corporate setting, as wonderful as the corporate setting is, you will miss out on some of the transformation that the Spirit of God has for you that will come only through personal worship. His presence should be honestly more important. So in your prayer time, think of it this way. A lot of times, and I think this is true for many Christians, especially younger Christians, I need this, so I'm going to, I'm going to pray about that. I need that. I'm going to pray about that. This person needs that. And so the prayer list devolves into essentially a laundry list of just asking all these different things, and then that's it. When you're done, when you're done with that, you're like, well, I'm done praying. I've, I've given God my list. And, and again, I would just say, if you had a friend who treated you the way you treat God, would you want them to be your friend? And the answer is probably not. If you had a friend who just came up to you and said, I need this, I need this, I need this, I need this. Bye, got to go. A relationship with God is, is being, a relationship is being with somebody. God desires to be with you. The way you cultivate sensitivity is, is it's just like, you know, Debbie and I have been married over 40 years, and, and now at this point, we, could, we can pretty much finish one another's sentences. We know what one another's thinking even before they say it. There's just that sensitivity, or we can sense the other person's mood without anything ever happening. And I'm not talking about, I'm talking about the subtleties of mood, not the obvious things when you can tell somebody's sad or something. You, you can sense that because you've spent time with a person. And that's the way it is when you're, when you're walking with the Lord. There, the, the Holy Spirit has moods. And the only way you'll ever learn the moods of the Holy Spirit and the ways of the Holy Spirit is if you spend time with the Holy Spirit. And one of the best ways to do that is to worship. Just to worship God. Derek Prince, he's since gone to be with the Lord, but a great Bible teacher, said this, if I have 10 minutes to be with God, I'm going to spend eight of them worshiping. The other two praying. You say, well, why is that? Listen, you can pray for a whole lot of things in two minutes. I mean, if, if we just, I would encourage you to do this. I've done this before with our students, I've said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna set my timer on my watch and you got two minutes to pray, go. Think of how much you can pray for in two minutes. It's a, you can cover a lot of ground in two minutes. But the thing is to be in the presence of the Lord and to spend time with the Lord and to wait on the Lord and to listen to the Lord. I would suggest God, will, you will hear his voice in worship almost more than any other place outside of maybe his word. Just be in his presence and he's going to talk to you. Just worship him. Worshiping the Lord is being with him. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He's a person. And he delights in interaction and relationship. He's a person to discover. He's a person to know. He's a, he's a person with whom you can have a friendship to enjoy. And all of that leads toward cultivating a sensitivity to the voice of God, the prompting of God, the working, because the Spirit of God speaks in a variety of ways. Not all of it is his word to your heart. Sometimes there's just a knowing, and you just know what you know. And how do you know it? Well, the Holy Spirit, you walk with him enough, you know in an instant God has put that in your, in your heart and your mind. Number four. Take five-minute breaks with, with God. 
Just stop periodically in your day to be in his presence. The psalmist writes this, and I love this. My heart has heard you say, come and talk with me. That's the heart of God for you. God wants you to come and talk with him. You say, well, how much time? It didn't say, my heart has heard you say, give me the next 10 minutes. It's come and talk. Just start talking to the Lord. And my heart responds, Lord, I'm coming. So there are times when you're, when, when you're sensitive to the Lord, there are times you know, hey, I just got to stop what I'm doing. And, and it might not be work. It might be something else. You might be, you know, just at your house and you're doing something else and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is saying, I want to talk to you. And so you stop, you go where you can talk, where you can listen to him. Psalm 16 and verse 8, I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. This is David saying, listen, I always have God right in front of me. I'm always thinking about him. I'm always listening for him. I'm always looking to him. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices and my body will also rest secure. David said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk really close to God. I'm going to keep him right in front of me. When, when you desire the Spirit of God to remain on you, as we read in John 1, what will happen is it will change how you live because the, the Spirit, it says he descended on Jesus like a dove. It doesn't mean he was a dove. It's not like there was a bird that came down. It was graceful. It was gentle. It, was, it came down on him. But what do we know about a dove? If you have a dove, doves are very, uh, they're spooked easily. So if you had a dove on your shoulder, you would walk very carefully. You would be very careful how you move. If the Holy Spirit, if you want him to remain on you, then your life has to reflect that means there are some things you're not going to do because you just don't want to risk that that's going to grieve the Holy Spirit. Some things you're not going to watch. There's some places you're not going to go because when you go there, you can tell your spirit, you can tell in your spirit that, that something is forfeited. And you value him more than you value whatever it is that, that you were going to be at or you, because you say, listen, I, I want the hand of God on my life. I want to walk close to the Lord. It really comes down to this. What's most pleasurable to your heart? What do you really want? And I believe I'm speaking to the choir because you're here at the prayer meeting. You're here because you love God. You're here because you desire more. And what I want you to hear is more is available and God desires more time with you and desires to show you more of his goodness in your life. Number five, read your Bible until God speaks. I have read, you know, I've, I've read the Bible. I've read different ways to read the Bible, different plans. And my default is the one-year Bible. I mean, it's just, I've done it since I was, you know, 21 years old. So I read through it and then read through it and then read through it. It doesn't really matter what day of the year it is. I'm not interested in the day of the year. I'm interested in just reading as much as, as I can until I come to that place where God speaks. And you don't, you'd be surprised, you don't have to read that much before he starts talking. It's very interesting, and it doesn't matter how many times you've read it, he's going to talk. One of the things that's really helped me is just to say, Lord, I'm, I don't want to read this just to check something off. I want to read it because I love you and I want you to put a love for you and for your word in my heart as I read it. And that's really changed my reading. And what you do is you just read it, and then when, when something jumps off the page, and it will, there'll be a phrase, there'll be a verse, there'll be a story and something in that story, there'll be a statement, and when you read it, it will grip your heart. And when it does, stop. And let the Lord work that into your heart. 
better to have that moment than to, if you're reading the one year Bible, to finish that day. I mean, um, stop and let the Lord do something in you. Stop and let him change you. Stop and let him feed you. Stop and let him encourage you. Stop and let him convict you. Stop and let him do something in you that causes you to leave that time different. Knowing him more and loving him more. And I would say this, if you're, if you're troubled or you're discouraged or you're filled with anxiety, Maybe you're depressed. Pick up the Psalms and just begin reading in the Psalms till you see the psalmist saying what you feel in your heart. Just keep reading until you get there and it won't take you that long. And then when you hear the psalm, when you read the psalmist saying what you feel inside, personalize it and say, God, that's me. And then just say it to God like the psalmist does and watch what God will do in your life. And watch how God will begin speaking to your heart and creating in your heart a sensitivity to the Lord. Listen, these are, these are times where God is doing extraordinary things. And he's wanting to do extraordinary things, not only in you, but through you. But if he's going to use you, listen, this is, God using somebody is not a, a select club for a few. It, we all, we all get to play. It's God's heart that we all get to be active in being used by God. He wants to use you, but the, the key to that is, is just listening to him. And I would suggest, you know, we, I love to watch the college students because we challenge them to pray before they go somewhere to ask God to, to show them who he's going to speak, you know, who he's sending them to. And let me just say this. I think that's a really good exercise for starting. However, I would suggest that as you grow in your ability to hear the Lord, then you move beyond praying for a single person and you recognize God is sending you to everybody. And you don't have to limit it to one person who has a, an ankle injury. And I'm not in any way diminishing that. Go pray for the person who has an ankle injury. You don't, I mean, pray for everybody. But in that moment, God will speak to your heart words for that person and the situation they're in. And if you're sensitive, you'll hear the voice of the Spirit. It'll just simply be a matter of your willingness to step out in faith and say what the Spirit has said to you. And when you do, it will change that person's life and it will change yours. And if God tells you to pray for somebody, you just need to assume God plans to heal them. Because he's not sending you to pray for somebody so nothing happens. He's sending you to pray because he wants to do something extraordinary in their life. But it all starts with just being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Listen, revival is, is coming. But the awakening, what's going to happen is the awakening can't be confined to the walls of this church or it will die. It has to go out. It, it has to change people so that when you're at Costco or Sam's Club or Walmart or Target or wherever it is that you're at, you're at the gas station, that you're so on fire for the Lord that it just comes out of you. And, and Monday through, through Saturday, you're seeing God do um, extraordinary things. Listen, it, in here is great, but... It can't just be in here. In fact, what happens in here should be a fraction of what God does in your life out there. And it'll happen as we're sensitive to the Spirit. Thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we want to let you know that we'd love for you to be a part of our online family. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell for notifications. You'll be so glad you did because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and it helps you know when we go live for our weekly services. We hope you have an amazing day and thank you again for watching. God bless.